Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for coming. We are in the middle of a um, discussion, a class on the uh, Shema Yisrael. Again, something that we say daily and uh, that uh, bespeaks of all of our faith in God and many other themes. So last week we were in the second chapter of the Shema and we're going to pick up from where we left off. And uh, we're in the middle, again, of that chapter. By the way, we finished off again about the uh, idea that we mentioned before of the Asafta de Ganecha, Vesirocha, Vesirocha, and you'll gather your grain and your wine and your oil. The greatest blessing we ended with last week is that you'll sow and you'll reap. There's no greater blessing than success. A person who feels success wants to do more. If a person feels failure, he wants to give up. And the greatest blessing that God can give us in the Shema, which is, by the way, singular, as we mentioned last week, is that you'll um, sow and you'll reap. Again, a great blessing. So let's continue. This week we continue with the words, the Nasati Eseb Esadachalav Amtecha. The Shema continues with the words, and I will give grass in the field for your cattle. From here we learn the law that you must feed your animal before you feed yourself. Um, when it comes to drinking, you, you drink first. We learned in the story of Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, who went to get a wife for Yitzchak, that she, uh, again, she gave him to drink first and then the camels. So when it comes to drinking, first you drink and then an animal. A person can go about three days without drinking, but you can go seven days without eating. So first you feed your animal, then yourself. We learn from this verse. Now there is a hint here that just like grass grows by itself, and Asati Asev, and will give grass, so too God will bless you, even with things that have you put little or no effort into. Again, it's a blessing of mazel, of just having good luck. The tour states that your animals will multiply. That's the blessing. The Shema continues with the words, with the Achalta Visavata. Very important. You will eat and you'll be satisfied. This is connected to the previous thought. When your animal eats and it's satisfied, then it'll work better and the field is more productive. Also, since your livestock will have abundance grass to eat, they'll be fat and succulent. And as a result, you will eat their meat and it'll be very tasty. Uh, that is in addition to grain, wine, and oil mentioned in the previous verse. Again, and you'll be satisfied based on a Ramban. There is no blessing that can be compared to a person being satisfied. As it says in Pirkei Avos, that who's a happy person? Sameach Bechelko, person who's happy with what he has. By the way, Sameach is present tense. The only person who's really happy is not a person who thinks about the past or, or, wor or hopes for the future. A person who is in the present. Enjoy the present. The example I give, again, imagine if you, someone gave you $100,000 as a gift. Before you received it, you may not have been happy. After you receive it, maybe you want another 100. But when you receive it, at that moment, you're thrilled. And that's where a person needs to live his life. So meach bechelko. Okay, you say the past is history, the future is a mystery. All we have is the present, and that's why it's called the present. Rashi states that the blessings of bread will be found in your stomach. It's not gluttony, but you'll be satisfied. Many times when you see people that are obese, it's not because they have a ravenous appetite. The reason why they eat so much is not hunger. It's because they're not satisfied. They're searching for something, a sense of contentment, but somehow they can't find it. The Rambam says, again, he was a doctor to the Sultan, and he stated in his time, the Rambam lived in the, uh, the end of the uh, 10, 11, 1100s, he stated that the most, most diseases, even in his time, came from overeating. And again, we see it very clearly today. Now the tone after this, the tone of the paragraph now changes. And the words are, Hishamru lochem, guard yourself. Rashi warns us, since you will eat and be satisfied, guard yourself, lest you rebel. For no one rebels against God, except from being, for being sated. After you'll be successful and sated, You'll start to serve other gods, believing that your success comes from you and not from God. You see yourself as a self-made man who serves his creator. Now the Ten Commandments were given on two tablets. The first tablet, five commandments, 
dealt with those laws between man and God. The second tablets contain five commandments with laws between man and man. People are most often careful with commandments between man and God. However, those commandments between Lachem, yourself, man and man, they are lax in. So when one sins against God, one should know he's commit, committed one sin. However, when he sins against another person, he sins twice. Once against man, and once again against God. Based on the Philos Gedolos. So this is the warning of the verse. Pen yifteh levavachem v'sartem v'avadatem Elohim achirim v'yishtachavisim lohem. Least your heart will be deceived, and you will turn aside and serve other gods and bow down to them. Rashi comments that sartem, turning aside, means to separate yourselves from the Torah, then as a result, you will serve other gods. The United States currency spells out one modern-day idol very clearly. It says on a dollar bill, in God we trust, the God of the dollar. I always remember, everyone, everyone worships something. It continues with the words, and the anger of God will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heaven so that there will be no rain. And the word matar, as we know, there's another word geshem for rain, but matar is reserved for special rain, rain of blessing. And again, if you don't listen to God, these things will continue, that the earth will not yield her fruit, her produce. Now the verse already said that there would be no rain. So why is this fact repeated? It adds that even if you plant next to rivers and wells, the earth will still not produce a harvest based on Orachayim. And even if you find a harvest, the end will be you'll lose it. Such as in the Second Temple era, when the Romans besieged the city of Yerushalayim. There was enough wood, food, and water in the city of Yerushalayim to last a 20-year siege. <laughs> and the zealots burned all the storehouses, forcing the people to fight the Romans and bringing about the destruction of the Second Temple. And you will perish quickly. Now, even though this seems very harsh, in reality, there's a real kindness in these words. Why? So that you'll not sin anymore in the land, the palace of the king, which may bring about the total destruction of not only the land, but also the nation. From, the, from off of the good land which God has given you. Now these words have great meaning. Sometimes the value of an item is not so much me measured by its monetary value. Sometimes it's measured by how the item was acquired. Again, Asher Hashem no sein lachem, which God has given you. You know, there's a story told of a righteous Jew who was the minister to a king. And one Shabbat, all the ministers were summoned to appear before the king. And it was an important meeting, and so the Jew was ordered to attend. After the session, the king took out a cigar. And with a smile on his face, he offered it to the Jewish minister. The Jewish minister accepted the cigar. But then the king offered the Jew a match to light the cigar, and the Jew declined. He, in turn, smiled at the king and said, When one receives a cigar directly from the hand of a king, should one burn it? No. I would much rather keep it as a souvenir. And so too we as Jews should feel proud of our land, if only for the fact that it was God Almighty himself who gave it to us. It continues with the words, V'samtem devarai elon, you shall place these words. Rashi states that even after you have been exiled, distinguish yourself by observing the commandments, such as tefillin, preparing a mezuzah, so that they not be considered new to you when you return to the land. Being an observant Jew, is not dependent on the land. God is with his people wherever we live. We are in the Galut, so is God Almighty. Now since the entire source for our being obligated in the mitzvot while in the exile is this present passage, 
and the commandments that the Torah enumerates in this passion, patch, passage are all personal obligations. We learn that any of the other commandments that are personal obligations, something that apply also in the exile. By the same token, we can learn the converse, that the commandments that, are, that is not a personal obligation, but rather an obligation on the land or its produce, such as truma or masrot, do not apply in the exile. And then it continues, al nafshechem, upon your heart and in your soul. Again, you need to serve God on both levels. Ukshartem la'ot otam al yedchem, yedechem v'hoyot otafos b'neinechem. You shall bind them for a sign on your hand, and they shall put frontlets between your eyes. David Melech says in Psalm 119, verse number 164, Seven times a day do I praise you because of your righteous judgments. Rashi states this refers what seven, two tefillin, four tzitzit, and one mezuzah. It also states in Kohelet, 412, and it says, V'chut ha-meshulosh lo b'mehero yinatek, that a threefold cord is not easily broken. Tefillin, tzitzit, and mezuzah, a three-folded cord. Now the midst of tefillin is next to the midst of educating children to tell us that just as one cannot fulfill the mitzvah of tefillin if he lets his attention wander from them, so too one cannot effectively educate his children if he lets his attention wander from them based on the Ger Rebbe. Limadatem otam et b'neichem and you shall teach them to your children. Now the word otam, them, has the same letters as the word emet, truth. It is incumbent upon parents, incumbent upon parents to teach their children to always be honest. Truth is the foundation upon which the world is built. The last three letters of the first three words of creation, Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning God created, form the word emet, the last letter of the last three words in creation, bara elokim lasot, that God created to do, again, form the word emet, truth. So God Almighty began and ended the creation of the world with the truth. It is our responsibility and obligation to spread truth in the world. The only truth that exists in this world is God and his Torah. Now what's interesting is that the word B'nei Chem that is used here for children is plural. In the first paragraph of the Shema, it was Levanecha, to your, ch your, ch your, ch your child, singular. To tell us that all children, plural, need to be educated. Not just those that are special and unique with high IQs. All children, all children are special and unique, regardless of their IQs and need to be taught according to their abilities. Now in the evening prayer it states, and we ask God to remove the Satan from before me and after me. Before me alludes to the day of judgment when the heavenly court will judge a person for all the sins that he committed while he was alive. Afterwards, alludes to all the sins that are committed by his children after his death. Those sins which can be attributed to his negative influence upon them or to their lack of knowledge in recognizing that there is a God in this world and that they have an obligation to serve him since he neglected to give them a Torah education. He is culpable even after he died based on Abtinim the Torah. The Dabra Bum to speak in them as I mentioned before in the first paragraph of the Shema this alluded to both the written Torah that begins with the Beis and the oral Torah that begins with the Mem. One of the things that a father is required to do is to teach his children Torah. As Rashi says, from the moment that your son knows how to talk, teach him Torah Tzivolanu Moshe. That Moses taught us the Torah. Rashi ends with the words that if your father does not do so, 
It is as if he buries his child. Continues with the words in the Shema, B'shiftecha b'veitecha, v'letcha b'aderecha, b'shapcha v'kumecha. When you're sitting in your house, when you are walking on the road, and when you lie down, and when you get up, one must teach his children how to act, not just when they're in a shul or synagogue, or in a religious environment, but also when they enter the secular world, when they conduct their business, and when they are amongst the Gentiles. There was a chassid of the Kutzke Rebbe, the Menachem Mendel of Kutz, who complained to him that when he was younger, he had time to do mitzvot, to learn Torah, and chassidus. But now, because of work and children and just the demands of life, he now had little time to study Torah. The Kutzker answered him with a quote from the Mishnah in Makos 23, that Ratzah that the Holy One, blessed be he, wanted to make the children of Israel meritorious. And so he gave them abundance of Torah and mitzvot. Now actually the Kutzka said that the statement is backwards. After all, if God wanted to give more merit to the Jewish nation who are busy, let him give them less mitzvot so that they'll be able to keep them, not more. And the Rebbe then explained that God gave many mitzvot that deal with professions such as the laws of plowing, Orla, Kilayim, Shemitah, for farmers. The laws of weights and measures, interest, ribbis, and sadaka for businessmen. And for all people, the laws about mezuzah, fences around a roof, laws about boundaries, etc. Many laws that deal with practical, everyday lives of people. And so even though they may not have time to sit and learn Torah, but they can practice the words of the Torah, which is even greater than learning. As Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel says in Pirkei Avot, chapter 1, Mishnah 17, Ein ha-medrash iker el ha Stu- Not study, but the deed. But the deed is the essential thing. And that is why the verse says, when you sit in your house and when you walk on the road. Basically, pur tzadikim. Continues with the word, Uksavta muzot beitecha v'isharecha. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. The Jewish alarm system. As a famous convert, Unculus told the Roman officer who was sent to bring him back to Rome, we both serve a king. With your king, he is on the inside and you are on the outside to protect him. We too have a king, but we are on the inside and he is on the outside protecting us. Unlike the mitzvahs in this section, the mitzvah of mezuzah is written in the singular. The Meshach Chachma explains the Talmud in Sanhedrin 113a rules that if a single mezuzah is found in a town, then it cannot be considered an ir hanidachas, a rebellious city, one that serves idols, and it therefore cannot be destroyed. So when a single Jew sits down to write a mezuzah and places it, it, it on his own doorpost, he can save an entire town from destruction. That's how powerful it is. In order that your days be multiplied in the days of your children on the earth, which the Lord swore to your fathers to give to them. The connection to the end of the previous verse teaches us that if you put a mezuzah on your doorpost, it will keep the angel of death from your house much like the blood on the doorpost of our ancestors in Egypt on the night of Pesach, when God Almighty killed all the firstborn Egyptians, but saved the firstborn Jews in their houses. Now the word Laman Yirbu Yemechem, that your days will be multiplied, Rashi states, if you do so, they will be multiplied, but if not, they will not be multiplied. These words also connect to the mitzvah of kibbut avayim, honoring parents. One of only two mitzvot, where the Torah tells us what the reward will be for fulfilling your obligation. The answer, harichat yamim, long life. The word, latet lahem, to give to them. Rashi states, to give you is not written here, but to give to them. Hence we derive the concept of what we call techiyat ha 
the resurrection of the dead, is inferred from the Torah since God's promise to the Avos of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov was never fulfilled. The lamb was never given to them, but he promised. And God never breaks the promise. So we know it will come at the end of time. Kimei Hashemayim al Oretz. It ends with these words. As the days of heavens above the earth. In the future, after the coming of the Messiah, the lifespan of the average person will be 500 years. Just like the distance between Shemayim Va'aretz, heaven and earth. The combined lifespan of the forefathers, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, was 502 years, which alludes to the 500 years plus heaven and earth, based on Rabbeinu Bachai. The Alshik states that keeping the Torah and mitzvot will lead, a physical, lead to a physical existence like the nation of Israel experienced at Mount Sinai, at the giving of the Torah, a spiritual existence in a physical world. The Aksav Yaqabala states, in order that you will experience the kind of life on earth that is normally reserved only for the souls that reside in heaven. Now, in addition, if you take the last letter of the four words, Kimea Shemayim al Haaretz, you have a Yud, a Mem, a Lamed, and a Tzaddik. It spells the word Melitz, advocate. God has told the Jewish nation that the witnesses of their actions would be heaven and earth since they are eternal. Our blessings and our punishments would come through their testimony. We know in Jewish law, it is the witnesses that administer the decision of the court. May all of these blessings come true with the coming of Mashiach Zikainu, quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for coming. And again, I hope this helps you to get through the Shema, which again is such a critical and important prayer that we say daily. God bless. Shabbat Shalom.